title of the talk, um, which is a bit different, I think, for this kind of conference. Um, so a talk that nobody wants to hear. It's kind of a clickbait of a title. Uh, of course, I think that you really should hear it and think about it, and maybe you can do it some, uh, at some point in your developer's career. So if you have checked the abstract, you have already noticed that it's about, uh, well, kindly, about, about uh, climate change um, and about the fact that the internet uh, a huge, has a huge carbon footprint. Um, if the internet was a country, it would have been the sixth largest polluter uh, with regard to carbon footprint in 2018. Um, these are my kind of warning slides, the yellow background. Um, we get through them quickly. Um, I don't know if you have heard it, but the last part of IPCC's report this year just came out. Um, and there it's, uh, yeah, they urge us kind of to do everything we can to reduce our emissions and immediate and deep emissions reduction across all sectors, including ours, of course, uh, to remain below the one and a half degrees, which is kind of a, tipping points for a lot of things that could go wrong in the future and maybe you're not uh, uh, not following it very well it's ab about 1.1 degrees already since the industrial revolution okay now we can go to the more positive or inspiring slides this one is a quote from Gary Cook from Greenpeace um, where he says that the internet the biggest thing is the biggest thing that we are going to build as a species and if we build it the right way with the right sources of energy it could really help power us our transition to renewables if we build it the wrong way it could actually exacerbate the problem so i think there is a lot we can do um, to reduce our impact as developers in this industry and i'm trying to i'm going to try to show you what you can do and how you can um, contribute to it um, I'm Chaba, I'm a, let's say, a sustainable web developer and little big things, also bioengineer, uh, bioengineer and a father. Um, um, I'm contributing to WordPress, yes, I'm a WordPress guy at the Drupal conference. It's very nice to be here, thank you for the organizers as well. To, uh, it's very cool to mix and match and learn from each other, so you're all welcome at WordCamps, which are going to take place this year as well. Um, I also contribute a bit to Climate Action Tech, it's a kind of tech group uh, who try to spread the word about, about climate justice within the technological community. And sometimes I do some crazy stuff with Extinction Rebellion as well. Um, and I also love to play music and play guitar. And my journey started actually a couple of years ago with a contest from a list apart it was called tanky apart um, the goal was to build a website that could load in and be functional in 10 kilobytes a bit like back in the old days when we didn't have all these tools and all this fun stuff um, so i did it um, i had built uh, the original website was seven kilobytes it was kind of plain a bit of a php but it was kind of plain HTML, um, loaded very quickly, and it was about global warming. Uh, and well, it kind of sit there for a couple of years until I heard about it at another conference, what was called Sustainable UX. Um, and then I got the idea to build it, build a WordPress blog from it um, to be able to talk about the impact of the internet climate change. Uh, that blog, globalwarning.blog, was about 30 kilobytes per page load a bit larger because it has a bit more information, images and stuff. It's not that alive now because there are a lot of people, a lot of smarter people who do a lot of things about um, to build or to go for a sustainable web. That's why I decided to build my talk around the um, Sustainable Web Manifesto, which you can find by the URL below. It's kindly provided to us by mostly by Whole Grain Digital, a UK agency. Um, there's also some things about that in a book called Sustainable Web Design by Tom Greenwood. So the six things we have to keep in mind when we try to build a sustainable web are uh, it has applications, the website should be clean, efficient, open, honest, regenerative and resilient. And in this talk I'm going to try to 
go through these and what you can do as a developer to, to start with build uh, clean um, websites. Why clean is the web not clean? Is it? Uh, why does it have a carbon footprint actually? Well, it's on electricity. It's, it lives on electricity. Without electricity, there is no web. So um, it depends on the source of electricity we use. And electricity can come from different sources. It's of course needed for servers and networks, devices, everything. Um, it can come from fossil fuels, nuclear energy, or, or renewable resources. Of course, renewables are the best thing because those give us uh, low carbon uh, energy. It's hard to put a number on the global, uh, globally how much electricity the web uses. Let's keep it around three to five percent. It can be more, less um, in each. Uh, um, it is found to be growing rapidly, so it will be larger in the next coming year, the coming years. So it's it's very interesting to to be uh, optimize it and try to. Um, minimize the, the footprint. Uh, why is the footprint coming or, or how about the footprint of it? I just said it would be the sixth country or, um, globally. Um, in 2017, there was a number 2% uh, of the global emissions that would be caused by the web. Um, and it's estimated to become, well, much larger in the future. Um, we're waiting for some more specific numbers on it. But let's start cleaning it already. Of course, you don't have. Um, you can do everything to to to. Uh, you, I, I mean, you don't have. Uh, um, you cannot change the user users' devices. You cannot change uh, the whole uh, network. But you have um, effect on where you host your application and your website. And at the greenwebfoundation.org. You can check whether your website runs on green energy. And they have also a list of green hosting companies where you can decide to move your websites to to um, reduce the carbon footprint of them. Well, that was it mainly about clean for in the context of development. Uh, the largest part of the talk will be about efficiency because of course, efficiency, how mo much more um, you, your website efficient. If your website is more efficient, then it requires less energy. So you can save a lot of things there. And if is the web actually efficient or has it become more efficient in the recent years? If we look at, look at data from httparchive.org, uh, we can see that uh, the size, the total kilobytes transferred to build a web page is rising readily. So in the last 10 years, it's about doubled or even more. Um, why is that? Probably mostly because we can, because because networks became became faster. So you don't notice if if things um, get bigger, and also the use of a lot of images, videos, and a lot of tracking scripts has increased uh, significantly. Um, if you look a bit further, we can see as well that for a medium web page, uh, well. This was astonishing for me. Uh, 500 kilobytes of JavaScript is loaded. And that's JavaScript that is mostly zipped, transferred through the wire. And then you have to unzip it, interpret it, and, and, and run it as well. So that costs a lot of energy. Um, also, you can see uh, for perfor performance wise um, that first contentful for pain and time to interactive are rather on the higher side of things. So I think that the web could be effic more efficient. Um, well, and how does efficiency relate then to, or the kilobytes you transfer, how does it relate to, to your uh, uh, CO2 or carbon dioxide footprint? Uh, this is probably the most complex uh, slide, slide of the presentation where we do some calculation. Um, so to start with, we need the energy or the electricity that we need to transfer a megabyte of data. That is the first line there. Um, then if we multiply that by the carbon intensity of uh, the network that we use, which you can find uh, through electricitymap.org, um, what does that mean, carbon intensity? How much carbon is generated when 
for that electricity to be um, to be produced. And on that side, you can find live data and, and historical even predictions about the carbon intensity of electricity. But once you multiply that, those two numbers, you have the amount of carbon dioxide that is uh, generated by transferring one megabyte of data. And then if you multiply that by the size of a medium web page that we just saw a couple of slides before, slides before uh, then you get a number around 0 0.6 grams of CO2 equivalent for a medium website. Um, don't be too strict on the numbers. These are estimates. These change over time. And it, this, this might seem very little in a way. But if you think about it, we're talking about millions, billions of websites, billions of users every day. So things go uh, increase quickly if you do the multiplication. Uh, but the other way around, this means as well that small changes can make a big difference. There's this guy, Danny van Koten, which I um, uh, put the URL for, as a blog post about how he um, reduced a plugin that he uh, um, makes contributes to uh, for a WordPress plugin. Actually, he reduced its size by 20 kilobytes, 20 kilobyte of JavaScript dependency that has been thrown out. And in his blog post, he describes the energy um, savings that you do by that, because that plugin is active on 2 million websites. And he found that this is the biggest contribution that he could take to reduce his own footprint. Um, yeah, I want to come back to the, the uh, electricity map for one second because it's a really cool implementation or use of this, of this data, of the API of the electricitymap.org by Branch Magazine. Um, they have built their website and they use the API to determine the carbon density and according to the carbon density of the, the network at that moment, they will or will not um, for example, send you images um, if the carbon intensity is high, so a lot of carbon is produced, electricity is coming from the bad sources, then you won't get the images by default. You can click to, add, uh, to get them. Um, it's a very interesting use of it. Uh, I think you can do a lot of uh, cool things with it. Apparently, Google uses it also, even to plan their heavy operations for moments that uh, electricity is is from good sources. Uh, so I, I think it's inspiring to use things to optimize uh, performance in, in, in these ways. Of course, the calculation that I just so show you, uh, you don't have to do it each time. There is a tool, like for everything, uh, kindly provided by Whole Grain Digital, websitecarbon.com. Uh, feel free to scan it and test the website if you want. Uh, they found that the average website, in their measurements, is providing like 1.67 grams of CO2 per page view. Um, I did some tests just to show you what results you get. So it's a very yeah, friendly kind of um, displaying uh, how, what, what your web website does well and doesn't do that well. It, I first uh, tested a certain conference website, maybe this one, um, that is running on sustainable energy apparently, it's just nice, but still there is some work and but below average on, uh, on its um, carbon footprint. The second one is actually my uh, day jobs company website, which is actually, um, w was actually developed by Calibrate a couple of years ago, and it does great uh, on the numbers. Unfortunately, it is then uh, hosted on standard energy, not renewable energy. And on the right, you see uh, the global warming.blog website, which I talked about in the beginning of, beginning of the talk. Uh, so efficiency, this is a bit of a practical uh, slide for developers, I think. Um, I think there are a lot of things you can do. Uh, just go through it quickly. You can reduce image sizes, uh, look for the right formats, use modern image formats such as WebP and AVIF that are 
have or getting a lot of support from modern browsers, optimize their resolution and sizes. Uh, you can provide tools to users to optimize images when they upload images to their site. Um, I do that for my WordPress sites, for example. Uh, try to use as yeah less less JavaScript, not too many, much JavaScript. Think about every thing that adds JavaScript. Whether you really need it, do you really need to track users? Uh, do you re really need to embed uh, a, a video? Those are things that give you a lot of um, scripts on your site. Also, fonts can be a lot of data to transfer. You can optimize the file format and also do subsetting. Subsetting means actually that you eliminate the characters that you don't need in your website's language. Uh, of course, your developers, so you know those two last things better than me, uh, cache all things and keep it static if possible. Every operation on your server takes energy. And of course, progressive web apps, an extreme example of that. You don't have to go back and forth if it's not needed. Uh, well, maybe this is the, 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 the most important thing. If you don't need the feature, really don't. It's also the best thing for support. Uh, really well supported, a feature that you don't implement. Okay, we got through the most, the largest part. Uh, we can go to open. And we're at an open source conference. Uh, with a window that is opening and closing as well. Um, I don't have to say a lot about this. I think open source projects uh, are great because you're actually standing on the shoulders of giants. You can start, you don't have to start from scratch. You can use things that other people have built and tested um, and you can learn from each other that way. Uh, accessibility is also a kind of important thing uh, in being open. Uh, you have to, yeah. You have to give people the the chance to use your application if they need it. Um, for example, if you use modern browsers, sometimes people have old devices and they cannot access something. Um, think about it before before dropping support for all their thing, all their things. Um, and also applications. You, if you have data that can be used by other uh, people, uh, for example. Uh, the data I just talked about, uh, about from electricity map, it can be very useful to have open APIs for that. Um, honest. I think there is work on honesty on the web. Um, there are things that are, you, uh, are, are uh, normal to be used on the web, like bits of dark patterns or sneaky tricks to get users to do things that they actually don't want to. If you think about just the cookie consent that you come uh, come, ac come across when you open a site and actually think I'm trying to just accept the essentials, but the button accept all is the largest or the only one you can find. Um, same thing about um, tracking people. There are actually alternatives to Google Analytics. You don't have to share data of your visitors with Google. Uh, I'm using Plausible, which is a very cool, lightweight and privacy-friendly um, alternative. But there are others, also open source, like Matomo. I think as an agency, you have also the choice to support um, honest and good businesses, um, as well as look at the long term um, and be kind, always be kind and ethical. The la um, almost, we're almost there, regenerative. Um, just like I said, we're at 1.1 uh, degrees of increase of temperature. Uh, even if we stop now emitting, still we feel uh, effects of climate change for the coming years, a couple of hundred years, even more. Uh, so there are things to fix and I think uh, that there are opportunities for us as developers and the web to empower people to take meaningful actions and to restore things instead of, yeah, let's say, mindful, uh, mindless consumption. Um, 
we can build applications that discourage bad habits and encourage good ones. Um, we are planning to get CO2 from the out of the atmosphere to reduce its uh, its uh, content there, but we have solutions for that. Trees, they do that for free. Uh, there are a couple of applications that have, have APIs, for example, to let you plant a tree after a certain action. You have search engines that do that, like Ecosia. Um, there are a lot of cool things that we can do uh, to be regenerative and uh, to fix things. And the last one, I like resiliency as well, because it's, yeah, it's kind of a sustainable, but even more flexible than that. Um, and I'm not sure if anyone has read the book by G Jeremy Keith about really resilient web design, uh, where he expla explains that the web actually is very resilient. The languages that it's based on, HTML and CSS, are resilient because they evolve, they don't break. Older browsers that come across new tags, they just ignore them. Newer browsers are mostly um, backwards compatible. Uh, so HTML and CSS will grow and change and uh, without breaking things. Um, there's actually an exception for that, it's JavaScript. JavaScript breaks, so be careful about that if you want to build a resilient web, because the web has to be resilient and, and at times of um, crisis, war, for example, uh, users have to be able to use applications that can even save lives sometimes. So keep things um, resilient, secure, and make them robust. So that was about it. I hope uh, you're ready to be clean, efficient, open, honest, and regenerative and resilient, and become a sustainability expert and contribute to, an, to a sustainable web. Thank you for your attention, and thanks all the sponsors organizers and the community and also the volunteers for organizing this conference. Um, I've added a couple of slides with resources such as books, tools and the link to the slides as well. If you have any questions, please. Yes, no. Okay. Yes. Hello, uh, thank you very much for the speech. I have to say it's one of the more surprising ones I've seen in the whole conferences. Um, I have a question about the whole API subject. You, we were talking about uh, how we as a us users have impact on, like on, on the whole carbon footprint, but how about API usage? Like when websites sync their information from another website or from an API, what kind of an impact does that have? Well, it's the same. It depends. Well, the the, the easiest figure to to uh, to look at is the data that we transfer, besides the host that you choose to host your uh, application on, and it's the same thing for applications. The data that is transferred, you can yeah, you can be aware of that and minimize it. I think APIs have a rather low impact because they just mostly send JSON files. So their sizes are a lot less than images, videos. Um, and of course, you don't have to use an API just to use an API. You have to look at the value you add to your users uh, and globally even. Um, so I think that right. we should yeah. consider that. Because I also think there's a lot of websites that just sync their information on a cron-based uh, event, but that doesn't always mean that the API has new information to share. So maybe we would have to look to ways to like find out, are there more yeah. items in the API, API that I can pull in or not? Yes. And not just brainlessly <laughs> pull the information without knowing if there's anything to pull in. Yes, it's kind of like uh, progressive web apps do. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Any more questions? One more. Like, 
uh, I just want to ask one question. It's like, I'm going to be a little bit pessimistic, maybe, but do you still think we can fix? It's like, like it, it's a, a, a very dark question, but there's something on my mind. Like, I see good initiatives, I see good things happening, but I also see, like, the the mountain ahead. The yeah. yeah, that's true. I don't think that we have, well, we can be pessimistic, but that won't bring us anywhere. So I think um, talking about it, doing things, um, talking about it in, in a friendly way, let's say, uh, because people tend to feel guilty doing stuff. Um, and just spreading the word. Uh, I think a lot happened in a couple of years. It's 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 getting more in the picture. Okay, with with the COVID crisis, it went back again, but now it's hopefully um, getting more attention. And uh, so, being optimistic is better <laughs> in, in this way. Oh, this is just the the question of like, is it possible? Yes, uh, if we ah, make some I, changes, I, I, like more I, I, I think one and a half is probably very optimistic at this at this moment. Um, but if try. we don't, yeah, need to try, I think. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Hi. Um, so I'm just thinking about the different technology stacks. You do WordPress, we're talking about Drupal, you can have static site generators. Do you have any kind of yardstick for sort of, should this be a WordPress site? Should it just be an HTML page? Should it be something more complex? I mean, how do you make those decisions quickly so that we're not necessarily always working with just our preferred technology? There may be a leaner way to do it. Yeah, it's a good question. It's a good question. I think it's it's we probably don't think about it because we're I'm a WordPress guy, so I make WordPress sites. And probably for a lot of clients, uh, a static site is a perfect solution. They don't. Even if they say they will blog, they will use it, they will update it regularly. They won't. So those, uh, yeah, those should be opportunities to just go um, static, go plain HTML. Um, the thing is that we kind of left it behind. There are less tools to start that. It's it's too easy maybe to set up a WordPress site with a standard theme. Um, I would like to say that I do that. But I have not much static sites as uh, as well, so uh, but it's 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 a good thing. It's 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 much more robust, much more quicker. Although that, I guess an extension to that, then um, are there tools that you enable on WordPress such that it essentially renders it out as a static site, so that it's not constantly hitting the database, it's not going back yes. to PHP. I guess obviously I don't know CDNs, varnish, other things on front of it, but are there quick solutions for? Yes, there of course caching. Everything you can is a good step in, in that uh, direction. But for WordPress, I know there are more and more tools. I think Stratic, it's called Stratic. Even plugins they have to, to create static uh, versions of your WordPress website. And that can be a good solution. Uh, it's, it's, gro it's growing rapidly. There are several solutions which I'm not always aware of, but maybe there is a future in that. Um, that Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? <laughs> okay, thank you.